you are here for an historic event as we are not only entertained but celebrate the final performance by Mr. Mark Russell here at the Carolina Theater. Tranquility stills our hearts and let us have no negative disputes. All the candidates reflect this time of cheer, except the one who makes me want to puke. 2016 November, bring it on! A campaign with no one to trust. When we're the greatest, we're the nicest. And despite the ISIS crisis, the only thing we have to fear is us. Look in the mirror, the only thing we have to fear is us. Good evening! Millennials. Before I continue, I'd like to share something with you of a personal nature, if I may. It's just that I'm so happy, so happy and, and, and thrilled because yesterday I paid off all of my student loans. <laughs> now, if you don't know anything about me, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I live in Washington, D.C. for the same reason. A coal miner lives near the shaft. We are a city of perpetual gridlock, particularly in Congress, where last spring, Congress wanted to commemorate the holiday Cinco de Mayo, but they could not agree on a date. <laughs> I was born in Buffalo, New York. I have a winter home in Buffalo, New York. I went to Catholic school. before I knew that Protestants also played basketball. <laughs> As a young man, I dodged the draft. I did it by joining the Marine Corps. And after the nuns in Catholic school, Marine Corps boot camp was a piece of cake. <laughs> I enlisted during the Korean War. The Forgotten War. I never forgot. I was wounded in that war. During that war, it was in Tijuana, but I was wounded. <laughs> and then I came home and raised a family. There we go. <laughs> Three children, seven grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. Like the time a five-year-old said to me, Grandpa, when are you going to make a noise like a frog? I said, why do you want me to make a noise like a frog? His mommy said, as soon as you croak, we're all going to Hawaii. <laughs> I was proud to have hosted a comedy show on public television. People still remember that show. The other day, a guy came up to me and said, we always used to watch your shows on PMS. <laughs> well, the show ran 30 years, and I'm still at it here at the tail end of our long national nervous breakdown, also known as Campaign 2016. My reliable sources, two bartenders in Buffalo, tell me that half the people in this country believe that America's best days are ahead of us, ahead of us, if neither candidate wins. <laughs> And so here we are, face issue number one, it just uh, broke through the news the other day, when the FBI, the Fumbling Bureau of Investigation, decided to reopen the case of Hillary's emails. Why? And if, you have, if you're only hearing this for the first time, you're not going to believe it, but the Fumbling Bureau of Investigation found 1,000 more emails that were sent by 
wait for it, Anthony Weiner. <laughs> that was the one missing element in this entire nutball campaign. The one missing thing, Anthony Weiner. <laughs> and all the comedians rubbed their favorite genie out of the bottle. And the genie popped out of the bottle and said, now what? And they said, genie, we want one more wish. What? You want one more wish? I've given you gifts that bring on the giving. The gifts that never stop giving. I gave you Hillary. I gave you Trump. What in the world else do you want? The comedian said, Anthony Weiner. <laughs> Why? And they said, well, we want to look into those emails that Anthony Weiner sent. And the genie said, look, Anthony Weiner does not send emails. Anthony Weiner sends briefs. <laughs> Pictures of his own briefs. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the Constitution is very clear on this. May I quote? In the event that the husband of a presidential candidate's top employee sends sex messages to teenage girls, that candidate must lose the election because her Republican opponent has such respect for women that he would never do such a thing. <laughs> well, more on that a little bit later. Let's uh, we'll have little snippets of the campaign review the entire campaign. No particular order. So uh, we hearken back to uh, the Republican convention uh, last summer in Cleveland, Ohio. All right, now, they were worried. They were worried about security. The Ohio State Police were tracking a heavily armed demonstrator who turned out to be the governor of Ohio, John Kasich. <laughs> He's the governor of Ohio. He's a Republican. The Republicans are meeting in Ohio, and he didn't show up at the convention. None of the prominent Republicans showed up. None of the Bush family. They didn't show up. The Romney family didn't show up. John McCain did not show up. The other senator from Arizona didn't show up. He said he had to mow his lawn. <laughs> and so the first speaker at the convention was good old Rudy Giuliani. And he was only speaking for a few minutes when it was obvious that he forgot to take his distemper medicine. <laughs> the next speaker was Melania Trump, the wife of the nominee. And she was speaking for a few minutes. It was obvious that she had plagiarized a speech made a few years earlier by Michelle Obama, especially when Melania said she first met Donald when he was teaching law at the University of Chicago. <laughs> well, the high point of the convention was the acceptance speech of the nominee, Mr. Trump. And it was a powerful speech, powerful. The people loved it because in that speech, he appeared to be presidential. President Mussolini. <laughs> And so it was obvious that the choice of his running mate, Indiana Governor Mike Pence, was exactly the right choice. Because as Trump began to get more and more off the rails and more and more out of control, they had to put a governor on him. But boom. Now, <laughs> now Donald Trump is not the first businessman who had never held public office to be nominated by the Republican. It happened many years ago in 1940. A man named Wendell Wilkie, he ran against Franklin D. Roosevelt. Toughest race Roosevelt ever had. Wilkie was a businessman, he never held public office. And in the middle of the campaign, Roosevelt's people came to him, says, we got the goods on Wilkie now. We found out he's got a mistress, yes! <laughs> Roosevelt said, let it go, boys, let it go. <laughs> so it wasn't long before this campaign deteriorated into dueling bimbo eruptions. <laughs> dueling bimbo eruptions. And I'm so confused, I don't know if today is a Bill Clinton bimbo eruption day or a Donald Trump bimbo eruption day. It started a few weeks ago with the release of these uh, tapes, these quotes, and these quotes are so filthy and disgusting, you're not going to hear them from me. Decided not to go there. Not gonna do it, not gonna do it, not gonna do it. Except, 
To say that those quotes suggest that when Donald Trump was a Boy Scout, he won a merit badge in institutional groping. <laughs> and they said, well, it was just locker room talk. Locker room talk, right? Look, I can tell you that in locker rooms, men do talk about sex, namely the lack of it. <laughs> So at this point, the Republicans trotted out all of Bill Clinton's old accusers, and the battle was on. And if you've ever raised little boys, you'll recognize the charges and the countercharges in this campaign. Why, he started it! And so at the second debate, there were all the accusers lined up in the front row. Kathleen Willey, Juanita Broderick, Paula Jones, I thought, my God, these people are bringing back all my old material. <laughs> like the time Bill Clinton took his dog to the veterinarian. And the vet said, do you want to have him neutered? And the dog said, yes. <laughs> things changed from the time I started doing this. So how has the politics changed? How the material changed? I think the biggest change, obviously, is that today's issues are so touchy, so sensitive, too hot to handle. I gotta handle them. But there's so many of these controversial issues, I have to double up on them to save time. So how do I do that? Uh, Bill Cosby and Donald Trump go into a bar? No. <laughs> Seated at the bar, Sarah Palin. Cosby gives Sarah a drink. When she wakes up, she endorses Trump. I can't keep track. Bill Cosby and Hillary Clinton go into a bar. Cosby gives Hillary a drink. When she wakes up, they're both in prison. By the way, did you know that Steven Spielberg is writing a movie about Hillary? What would it be called? Steven Spielberg writing a movie about Hillary? Saving private emails. <laughs> so I called Clinton campaign headquarters the other day to see how they answered the phone. Good afternoon, you have reached Clinton campaign headquarters. If you would like to contribute to the Clinton campaign, press one. If you'd like to contribute to the Clinton Foundation, press one. <laughs> the Clinton Foundation, the New World Bank. Hillary and Bill have lots of folks to thank. If they make it to the White House, it will be said, Lincoln Bedroom's going to need another bed. The Clinton campaign is transparent and open. Nothing to hide. If she's elected, the Clinton Foundation will stop taking any more bribes. Oh, where, oh, where have those messages gone? Oh, where, oh, where can they be? They were erased from her server at home. The emails of Hillary. She testified she deleted them all. Like the burning of tapes, and what's worse, for convenience sake, oh, give me a break. Two phones would not fit in her purse. The Fed's newest mission, Wiener's transmission, whether they were classified, there are no secrets pending. Look what she's sending. Look what he's sending. Wiener has nothing to hide. Wiener has nothing to hide. We are paying for all those Inspector Clouseau who keep digging for clues in the dark. It's their big undertaking, a martyr they're making. It's Trump versus Joan of Arc. Got a match? It's Trump versus Joan of Arc. There we go. Trump giving you enough material? <laughs> I said, no, he's charging me for it. <laughs> you know, it would have been nice, about a year and a half ago, if he had made one speech and put all of those blockbusters into one speech, each one of which should have uh, disqualified him from running for president. Put them all in one speech, a year and a half ago, like uh, if he had uh, insulted John McCain, right? 
Or it says that Mexicans were rapists. Aha, that's it. No, no. Or if he said that, uh, except for the support of the Klansman, David Duke. Aha, that's it. No, no. Or if he said that Japan ought to have nuclear weapons. Or if he racially profiled a federal judge. Aha, no, no. <laughs> if he uh, mocked a disabled reporter. Aha. No, no, not quite. If he bragged about the size of his hands, not to mention his penis, and I'm sorry I mentioned it, it's no disrespect to a gold star family. And you know, he, he's already had a national security briefing. They shared classified material with him. I hope they gave him the wrong material. Uh, Mr. Trump, we're worried about Liechtenstein. <laughs> optimistic, got a little over a week left, and I, I feel that as he becomes more self-absorbed, more full of himself, he will explode. <laughs> An unlimited source of natural gas without fracking. <laughs> and I will take the high road with Mr. Trump. I will not stoop to his level. I will deal with him with sophistication and nuance. <laughs> sophistication and uh, nuance. <laughs> oh, that Donald is a schmuck. T-R-U-M-P. He's high in the polls, that's just our luck, says the GOP. He drove away the women and the Mexicans, too, who carried the biggest, well, hoop de doo With the Donald, we are stuck. O-S-H-I-T To the uneducated He's called the rain Yearning to be led That thing on his head He puts in a cage When he goes to bed Give me a T, give me an R, give me a U-M-P Dumbing it down for posterity He's good for comedy Yes, it's true Vote for the level and the joke's on you Bye. There we go so this sophisticated. There was no nuance. Try it again. <laughs> oh, Trump is humping the country from sea to shining sea. Trump is humping the country. He's humping you and he's humping me. He was born in a little log penthouse Mama taught him never to brag you. Now he's supported by Chris Christie. What we have here is matching gas bags. Oh, Trump is humping the country. He's humping you and he's humping me. Now Obama wrote his memoir. He called it the audacity of hope. Trump wrote a book on etiquette. All the availability of growth. Oh, Trump is humping the country. He's humping me and he's humping you. Now he needed help to get the women's vote, so we called in Randy Roger Ailes. Remember a moment of nostalgia. Times like these are missing Dan Quayle. Now I know my song is a little bit vulgar. Analogy. But if you wake up in November and you've been humped, don't come crying to me. Hump. Well, that was rather crude. Let's try it again. <laughs> Sophistication and nuance. He's our utmost meanie, like I said. He's our Mussolini. He's the guy who only thinks of number one. Added to the list, he's misogynist. He's a till of the hun must we march to this different drummer. If it's Trump, it's a total bummer. He has all the charm 
of a weekend in Pyongyang. <laughs> and when the housing market crashed, pop champagne you can't fix. What do you think needs fiction? This is sick. I'm missing Nixon, and so you know just where I'm coming from. Have we gone insane going down the drain in a spin? And if this guy wins, Canada, here I come. In the pit! Seven times eleven if he quits. There's a God in heaven. Don't delude yourself into thinking he'll suffice. He's a royal pain, he's a big migraine, he's the Antichrist, he's a fool, a well-known liar, he's as cruel as a pet shop fire, Ooh. or am I overkilling with my verse? Am I going too far? Below the bar? Am I too unkind? I can read some of your minds. You're thinking Hillary is worse. <laughs> Here's the case of the nuance. Well, we have some of the runners up, some of them uh, that, uh, that never made it, and they lost out to Trump. And these, a lot of Republicans think that either one of these guys could have, uh, could have beaten Hillary. Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz, uh, he's the one who uh, tried to shut down the government with a filibuster where he uh, quoted Dr. Seuss. <laughs> I can't improve on that one. Um, <laughs> so Ted, you remember when, this was last spring, when Trump said that Ted Cruz's father hung out with Lee Harvey Oswald? <laughs> now, before Wiener, this was the thing. This is the one missing element, I said. This is the missing element of this entire nutcase Mark Brothers movie, otherwise known as Campaign 2016. The one missing element, Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> and Ted Cruz had to go on television to deny that his father killed John F. Kennedy. <laughs> and we will never know with 100% certainty if Cruz was being sarcastic. <laughs> Cruz made history last February when he became the first Canadian citizen to win the Iowa caucuses. <laughs> well, you say he has dual citizenship. Yes, he does. He has dual citizenship with Canada and Pluto. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people think that uh, Senator Marco Rubio of Florida uh, could have beaten Hillary. Uh, Rubio, he wound up winning two primaries, Minnesota and Puerto Rico, <laughs> giving him a solid lock on the Hispanic Swedish boat. <laughs> I have a friend in Minnesota, he's half Swedish, half Palestinian. His name is Yasser, you betcha. <laughs> well, Rubio's own Republicans threw him under the bus a couple of years ago when he came out in favor of immigration reform. The man is a proud son of Cuban immigrants. But the Republicans sent him a message. They said, we'll give you the nomination, Marco. But we have to deport your parents. <laughs> I miss Jeb Bush. It was supposed to be Jeb. The American tradition of royal succession. <laughs> Low point in Jeb's campaign. He's making a speech one night. He had a nasty heckler in the audience who yelled out, get off the stage. It's over. Jeb said, but mother, <laughs> don't butt mother me. Go to your room. I miss Dr. Ben Carson. God bless him. Soft-spoken, kind of shy, intense, creepy. <laughs> A brain surgeon, which means he's smart, right? I thought so, <laughs> until he started saying things. <laughs> like when heterosexuals get out of prison, they're automatically homosexual. <laughs> and that we should never, ever have a Muslim president. And that if everybody owned a gun, there never would have been a Holocaust. Which proves you don't have to be a brain surgeon to be a brain surgeon. <laughs>
On the other side of the aisle, I, I miss Bernie Sanders. That was quite a thing. The young people love Bernie Sanders, and we were treated to the spectacle of 20-somethings flocking to a 74-year-old. Classic case of common core math. <laughs> I thought if Bernie seduces any more young people, they're going to give him his own parish. I know. Can't make this stuff up. It's a cliche, but it's true. Oh, they try, you know, the Hollywood, the television industry, they make up things. They come out with a series uh, about Washington. None of them ring true. Netflix has a bunch of them. House of Cards, right? House of Cards. Hillary has been compared to the evil first lady in House of Cards. Claire Underwood. And her evil husband, President Frank Underwood. Played by Kevin Spacey. And of all the creepy characters Kevin Spacey has played in his career, the role of President Frank Underwood is the creepiest. If you haven't seen House of Cards, let me tell you what it's all about. This show, House of Cards, all about a place called Washington. A cesspool where pigs wallow. But hey, it's all in fun. And a president, Frank Underwood, a sneeze, a snake, pure scum. He makes Machiavelli look like Thomas Jefferson. This House of Cards is fiction isn't true, let me be clear. Manipulating and conniving, but never have an ear. Call me Pollyanna. Plot. Next thing you know in Washington, we'll be legalizing pot. Frank Underwood's job description, he just moves the sludge, brings the lambs to slaughter, and he squashes them like bugs. The critics say the show brings politics to low regard. No, the people hated politics long before the house of cards. Congratulations, Netflix. The show's a hit, not good. People wanted leadership. They got Frank Underwood. Like I say, the show is fiction, an imaginary plot for a real life president. Kevin Spacey has a shot. <laughs> oh, my friends, we are looking at a time where we are closing up to Cuba. Cuba, no longer designated as a country that fosters terrorism. Cuba's new designation, a land where old cars go to die. <laughs> We're torn apart by so-called religious persecution. Questions in this climate are being asked. Questions like, can a Christian bakery... What the hell is a Christian bakery? <laughs> can a Christian bakery be forced to sell hot cross buns <laughs> to Jewish lesbians? <laughs> Can a transgender person... Oh, he's not going to go there, is he? <laughs> Can a transgender person be forced to bring a birth certificate? <laughs> to go to the bathroom <laughs> in North Carolina. <laughs> and the only alternative to go to the bathroom in South Carolina. <laughs> North Carolina is a great state. I mean that. I have family in North Carolina, and I love them dearly. But <laughs> I must know my job. <laughs> Here's the fact you must assume to use the powder room in Carolina. If you're gender, you have trans to have your birth ID in hand, or they will find you. If you are now a woman, the governor does not care. He said, now use the men's room. No one will bother you there. To break the bathroom laws of crime. Where do politicians find the time? Can you perceive it? Here in old NC, bring your birth ID to pee. Can you believe it? Your state just must be tranquil and at peace through and through. 
the cops must all look busy. So here's what they do. Hang around the bathroom stall to see if you have balls in Carolina. When a man becomes a woman, she will make 79 cents for every dollar she made when she was a man. Now you would think employers would be fine with this pay cut. <laughs> We're living in a time where there is a vacancy on the Supreme Court for too long a time, in my opinion, since the passing away of Justice Scalia nearly a year ago. And the Republicans say, we don't care who Obama nominates to the court. We're going to turn it down. Don't care who it is. Turn it down. If Obama nominated Jesus Christ, the Republicans would say, well, there are three Jews on the court already. <laughs> so things are bad. You hear that all the time. People have, have you ever seen things as bad as they are now? Yes, I have, actually. That period between July 1776 and October 2016. <laughs> Last couple of years, ladies and gentlemen, I felt like Rip Van Winkle. Waking up from a 20-year-long nap, sees a newspaper headline, Russian aggression, Russian military takeover, as we attempt some sort of detente with the Russians. Detente is one of those words left over from the last Cold War, where we said that detente with the Russians is like going to a white swapping party, coming home alone. <laughs> So mad Vlad Putin moves into Crimea and then Syria. And President Obama lays down a red line, and that original red line will be on permanent display in the Obama Presidential Library. <laughs> All the other red lines will be in storage in the basement. Putin moves into Crimea, he says to those people, said, you are no longer in Ukraine, you are now in Russia. And with that, a young man runs into the house, Papa, Papa, guess what? We're no longer in Ukraine, we're in Russia. And the old man said, thank God those winters were killing me. <laughs> Obama warned Putin. He said there will be costs. Ooh. Everybody. Ooh. There will be costs. Ooh. Translation. Go ahead, Putin. Make my day. You think I'm bluffing? Ask Siri. <laughs> what he should have said was, Putin, how dare you invade another country for contrived reasons? <laughs> That's our job. Here's Putin's response to the world. How I miss the good old Soviet Union. All the years that followed. For a drive. Time to have a Bolshevik reunion with a hammer and a sickle on our fly. Ah, 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 day, my friend, we love and never end. Oh, how I miss the dear old KGB when Pravda was the news. We stood in line for shoes, so what we all have of Germany. Now the time to relive our past glory. The Russian bear is back, so give him room. Status quo in Russia, end of story. See Comrade Lenin smiling in his tomb. My name is Lenin. Hey, world, look up here. Just call me Tsar. What country's next of all? It could be Latvia. Or it's deja vu, I'm putting up a wall. Those were the days, my friend, we thought they'd never end. Now they're back, just the way things are. And I'm back in the game. We'll change our name. We're going back to the old USSR. Union of Soviet Syrian Republic. We're going back to the old USSR. Hey! Every 
we are in Washington, D.C., we observe that useless annual exercise known as the State of the Union Address. We do not need the State of the Union Address. Everybody knows what the State of the Union is. Take your pick. Is the State of the Union psychotic, neurotic, apathetic, all of the above, or narcotic? For the first time in decades, people are smoking indoors again. As long as it's pot. Otherwise, outside. <laughs> and as more and more states are legalizing recreational marijuana and same-sex marriage, because it says in the Bible that when two men lie together, they must be stoned. <laughs> People say, where are the heroes anymore? Where's the leadership? Where are the heroes? I have my heroes. I have my mentors. My own personal Mount Rushmore. There they are up there. Mark Twain. Will Rogers. The great American satirist Mort Saul. The Pulitzer Prize winning humor columnist Art Buckwall. The satirist and mathematician Tom Lehrer. He was the one. He was the one who said that satire dies. Satire dies when the line between the satire and the original event is invisible. And so this happened. Satire died when they handed the Nobel Peace Prize to Henry Kissinger. Or you might say when they handed the Nobel Peace Prize to Barack Obama for, uh, what the hell was it? Uh, he kept Al Qaeda out of Newfoundland. That was it. That was it. During Watergate, President Richard Nixon had a secretary named Rosemary Woods. She was the one who erased 18 and a half minutes from the incriminating White House tape. Art Buckwald said at the time that if Rosemary Wood had been Moses' secretary, we only would have had three commandments. <laughs> When the German rocket scientist Bernard von Braun wrote his memoir, he called it, I Aim for the Star. Mort Saul said he should have called it, I Aim for the Star, but I hit London. <laughs> Will Rogers said that if George Washington came back to this country, he would sue us for calling him the father of it. <laughs> of course, Will Rogers once said he'd never met a man he didn't like. Well, she never met Donald Trump, did he? <laughs> Mark Twain worked for a couple of years in my hometown of uh, Buffalo. He, had, he worked on the newspaper there. True story, the city potentate came to him one time and said, uh, Mr. Twain, we, uh, we want you to help us. We want to build up tourism in upstate New York. And Mark Twain said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. As it happens, I'm writing a satire on the Bible. Give me $1,000, and I'll place the Garden of Eden in Niagara Falls. <laughs> now that satire of the Bible was interesting. Letters of the Earth, some of you are familiar with it. Hot stuff, very, very controversial. The publishers wouldn't touch it in those Victorian times. They ruled that it could be published not until 50 years after Mark Twain died. Now in that satire, there was one part of it that I just never thought of. It never occurred to me the immense problem, the immense sanitation problem on Noah's Ark. <laughs> now, uh, Mark Twain's most famous statement, I guess you're familiar with, he says, suppose, suppose you're in Congress, suppose you're an idiot, but I repeat myself. <laughs> now, Mark Twain and Will Rogers never had to deal with this hot-button topic we're talking about here today. Uh, abortion, same-sex marriage, I mean, uh, how would they handle that? I mean, th this theory, uh, among the right to lifers, and I have no uh, quarrel with that, that a 20-week-old uh, a fetus, right? A fetus at 20 weeks can, quote, fondle itself and feel pleasure, unquote. Now, as I recall, in my case, it was more like 15 weeks. <laughs> so a couple of years ago, I'm walking around Washington, D.C., I'm strolling around, and I go by in front of the Supreme Court. There's a big demonstration in front of the court because inside, they're having oral arguments on the controversial subject of same-sex marriage. There was a lady in the crowd. She's holding up a sign, kind of a funny sign. It was all over the internet. 
It said, gays have every right to be just as miserable as I make my husband. <laughs> I would have carried a sign that says, marriage between a man and a woman is a sacred tradition as prescribed in the Bible, if you don't count the concubines in the Old Testament. <laughs> so a guy says to me, don't you know that homosexuality is an abomination? It's in the Bible. I said, I know that. It's in the book of Leviticus. It follows the verse that says it's an abomination to touch the skin of a dead pig. <laughs> A dead pig skin, which puts football in a whole new life. <laughs> you want proof that God has a sense of humor, you read your Bible, my friend. <laughs> Book of Exodus, thou shalt not cook a young goat in its own mother's milk. I agree, I never like my goat cook like that. <laughs> my little olive oil, lemon, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Deuteronomy, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's donkey. It's in there. Chapter 5, verse 21, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's donkey. Well, these days, outside of the Ozarks, <laughs> you don't see much of that sort of thing anymore. Again, Deuteronomy. Uh, a direct quote here. All right. When two men are fighting, and the wife of one man intervenes to help her husband, by grabbing the testicles of the other man, her hand should be cut off. Wow. <laughs> Believe it or not, I once saw a fight exactly like that. <laughs> in a biker bar right here in North Carolina. <laughs> And the woman was not punished. I should left the bar with the other man. <laughs> and went off to a Trump rally. But anyway, religion. Religion. I love it. Years, years ago, my wife and I were in the city of Salem, Massachusetts, on Halloween. Now, Salem on Halloween is like being in New Orleans for Mardi Gras, which means they pull out all the stuff. And in Salem, it's all about Salem witches and witchcraft, and ghosts, and goblins. And in the middle of town, there was this church, and they hastily put out a sign disclaiming all of the activities. And we don't go along with any of this activity in Salem today, the supernatural, the occult, the paranormal. We don't condone any of that here at the Church of the Immaculate Conception. <laughs> New Testament, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Do you get the idea the only ones in heaven are camels and poor people? <laughs> Look at the questions raised by religion. If you sell your soul to the devil, do you need a receipt for tax purposes? <laughs> what is the difference between heaven and hell? Location, location, location. <laughs> if you give up sex for Lent, are you looking toward Easter for all the wrong reasons? <laughs> And so these social issues have evolved slowly, slowly over the years. They did away with don't ask, don't tell in the military. Seems to be working all right. Gays serving openly in the military. No problems. A couple of small changes, like every morning at Reveille, the Buglers play Broadway show tunes. <laughs> New York was one of the first places to legalize same-sex marriage, which paved the way for Donald Trump to be engaged to himself. Uh, <laughs> And I'm sure you've driven out on uh, country highways. You see these uh, highway uh, signs, adopt a highway. You've seen those signs, adopt a highway. If a gay couple <laughs> adopts a highway, will the highway grow up to be straight? <laughs> Do good to those who hate you? Come on. See, if we were literally a Christian nation, a couple days after September 11, 2001, George W. Bush would have gone to New York, stood up there at ground zero with a bullhorn, and he would have said, we should all forgive Osama bin Laden. And a literally Christian nation would agree with, with editorials and public opinion. Well, you say, I'm not being realistic. Okay, here's what I think might have happened. Bush stands up there with a bullhorn. He said, we should all forgive Osama bin Laden. And I think at that point, God would have come down from heaven and said, time out. 
What are you, nuts? <laughs> Forget what my son said about putting to those who hate you. He was young. He was idealistic. <laughs> of course, Bin Laden should be punished. And God said, I can tell you where he is. And the crowd moves him. He said, he's in a big compound in the town of Abbottabad, Pakistan. Check it out. So it took a while, but that's where he was found. And nobody in that town of Abbottabad, Pakistan said they knew he was in the compound. We did not know. We did not know he was in the compound. <laughs> Come on, Pakistani intelligence had a top secret code name for the compound. Bin Laden's house. <laughs> I try to be open-minded, try to have a broad mind. I'm, I'm for same-sex marriage, I'm for gun control, hell, I'm for background checks for shotgun weddings. <laughs> People yearn for compromise. Let me tell you what compromise was. Suppose the Republicans wanted to post the Ten Commandments in a federal courthouse, okay? The Democrats would offer a compromise. They say, how about five commandments? <laughs> so we'll remove coveting as a sweetener. <laughs> and so they debate the issue in the United States Senate late into the night, it's the middle of the night, three in the morning, they're still at it, they're tired. One of them tried to sneak the Ten Commandments into the farm bill. <laughs> Another one tries to sneak the Ten Commandments into the Consumer Product Safety Bill. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife while standing on a metal ladder in an electrical storm. <laughs> See, all I try to do is to relate to the millions of American families out there who keep an addled uncle in the attic. <laughs> I can say that because in my family, I am that uncle. <laughs> For example, I was recently the victim of identity theft, a thief. Stole my identity, but the thief returned my identity to me because the thief did not like having my identity. <laughs> the thief did not like being an 80-year-old comedian with arthritis. People say, oh, 80 is the new 60. No, it isn't. <laughs> Actually, I'm 84. The only consolation is, if I was dyslexic, I'd be 48. <laughs> you know you're 80 when you remember Pearl Harbor, but you don't remember what she did. <laughs> you know you're 80 when you confuse Warren Buffett with Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> you know, one owns Margaritaville, the other owns the gross national product. <laughs> and you remember a time in this country, you remember a time in this country, when condoms were not distributed in the high schools. Trojans might have been the name of the football team. <laughs> and you remember a time when the word tweet meant something completely different. Now, by now, you may have gathered that I am not terribly comfortable with 21st century technology. And nobody seems to care. Nobody seems to care. You could be driving out on that same highway, and thousands of miles away, a guy is at his computer disconnecting your brakes. <laughs> Say the USA in your Chevrolet. Relax, ride to enjoy the ride. In this computer age, your brakes may disengage. Your steering mechanism up and dies. Some cars will be recalled sooner or later. Let's hope before you are recalled by your creator, you better say a prayer. Your airbag has no air, but you all love your computer, so who cares? It's the vocabulary. I was out of the room when they coined these phrases, Google, Yahoo, Twitter, Tweet, Android, Bluetooth, Yelp, Doo-Doo Kaka, that's what I think. <laughs> I am told, maybe you know this already, I am told there's such a thing as wired diapers. Wired diapers. When they need changing, 
They notify your smartphone. Is that what they mean by streaming? Everybody got to have the latest phone. What's the latest phone? The iPhone 7. It's got all the bells and whistles, state of the art, got everything, catheter, I don't know. Got another question. What's this national obsession with a hashtag? I don't mean to whine, that's every poster, every sign, begin with hashtags. In every conversation, it's the latest exclamation. Don't mean to me the meaning, just tell me the meaning. It was pound sign yesterday. While I was away, it changed the hashtag. Well, it's hashtag this and hashtag that. It's annoying. By the way, what's a Bitcoin? What's a cloud? For crying out loud, language destroying. Another phrase that makes no sense. Cognitive dissonance. English is my mother tongue. But those mothers all have clung to a pile of verbal dung. And I'd like to see them hung. Hashtag hung. <laughs> Kindle. Good God. When you walk into an attorney's office, would you rather see an impressive array of legal books? or a Kindle on an empty shelf. <laughs> All I do is push this little button and it turns a page. Whatever did we do before? <laughs> That's what I tell my grandchildren. You know, kids, oh, you're in. We have to turn these pages by hand. <laughs> no, Grandpa, no. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your favorite thing on the internet? Not, what is it? Cybercrime? Child molestation on chat rooms, what's your favorite thing? Federal employees watching pornography on government time, huh? What's your favorite, what's your favorite thing? Cyber tax criminals pocketing your refund. These computers that contain toxic chemicals assembled by exploited labor overseas. What's not to love? So what do you call it when a texting pedestrian is run over by a texting motorist? I call it making my day. <laughs> Actually, I feel sorry for you folks. Yeah. You're the ones with the addiction. Come on, a lot of you would like to check your email right now, wouldn't you? <laughs> Go ahead, I don't mind. It's rude, but I don't mind. And I dare say there might be some of you who not only want to check your email, but maybe you'd like to light up a cigarette. Go ahead, light up, I don't mind. I'm not all that anti-smoking anyway. I mean, what do you get when you quit smoking? Five more years in the nursing home. Yippee. <laughs> I'll tell you who else I feel sorry for. People who are bipolar and have dual citizenship. <laughs> That's gotta be confusing. By the way, you men, you know you're 80 when you go to the bathroom and you suddenly realize that as far as you're concerned, trickle-down does not apply to economics. <laughs> as more and more Americans are living longer, it is estimated that in the year 2020, that year alone, 150,000 Americans will reach the age of 100, and they will all have valid Florida driver's licenses. <laughs> so history will tell. I'm a history buff. Every day I buff my history. There's uh, history being made in New York of the Broadway, uh, Broadway show world. Real history. And this is a parody on a, a song that Irving Berlin wrote called Alexander's Ragtime Band. This is a parody of it. Come on here, Alexander Hamilton. A Broadway show, and did you know, those founding fathers sure had fun. As they sang and danced across the stage, the British would attack, only to discover that George Washington was black. As was Thomas Jefferson, a theatrical fact. Come on along, come on along, and let me take you by the hand. 
to take a trunk, to take a trunk, have your credit card in hand. You can pay a thousand dollars just to see the show today, or eight hundred fifty for a Tuesday matinee. There's a ticket scalper in plain sight for every light on Old Broadway. And Aaron Burr, that dirty cur, he moves in for the kill. Hell said he, you'll never be on the new ten dollar bill. So if you want to see what happens, better save your pennies. Sell an heirloom for standing room at Alexander Hamilton. Da 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 Alexander Hamilton. Da 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 da. Alexander Hamilton. Yes, it's a big Broadway show. And so Alexander Hamilton will remain on the ten dollar bill, but Andrew Jackson. Will be taken off the twenty. He will go to the back of the bus, the back of the bill. <laughs> he will be replaced by Harriet Tubman and other women who have been considered: Eleanor Roosevelt, Rosa Parks, Amy Schumer, <laughs> and uh, Margaret. Uh, what was the uh, the mother of uh, birth control? Well, Margaret Sanger. That's my favorite part, by the way. The mother of birth control. If you put Margaret Sanger on the money and those assets would never multiply. Now, the point is <laughs> that historians only tell us half the story. Uh, for example, uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. It wasn't an address at all. It was just brief remarks after the main speaker that day, a man named Edward Everett. Edward Everett, a very prominent man. He had been minister to Great Britain, president of Harvard, uh, speaker of the House, the most prominent orator of his day. And Redford spoke for two hours that day, followed by Abraham Lincoln's brief remark. What Lincoln really said at the beginning, he said, "You know, it seems like four score seven years ago, whenever it started that speech." <laughs> Only tell us half the story. The Liberty Bell in Philadelphia has a crack in it. Everybody knows there's a crack in the Liberty Bell. We were never told it was cracked on purpose by the Philadelphia Tourist Bureau. <laughs> Who said? Otherwise, it's just a freaking bell. <laughs> a few years later, in that same Independence Hall in Philadelphia, the founders drew up the Constitution. We we're never told about the night they were so stressed, so bummed out, worn out, they needed to relax. They went into town, got rip roaring drunk, staggered back to Independence Hall in the middle of the night, and drew up the Electoral College. <laughs> Let me tell us half the story. Afghan war, piece of cake. We said we'll be out of there in three months. We'll install democracy in this country. We'll put flat screen televisions in their caves and open up a Hooters in Kandahar. We were done. <laughs> never told about that. We go back to biblical time. Mary and Joseph. We were never told how they met. How did Mary and Joseph meet? Christian mingle. It's so obvious. <laughs> Go back to 1500s, a Polish uh, astronomer, Copernicus. Terrible story. Copernicus was condemned by the Catholic Church for teaching that the Earth revolves around the sun instead of the other way around. Hundred years later, Italian astronomer Galileo condemned for the same reason. But Galileo was later pardoned. How much later? 1983. <laughs> Meanwhile, Copernicus is still rotting away in hell. Well, back in '83, I received a copy. A Vatican's pardon of Galileo, I'd like to recite it now. We're so sorry, Galileo, for any harm that we've done. We confess it was our bad in that matter of the sun. <laughs> After all those years in prison, three centuries in the can, you say you're now a Lutheran. Of course we understand, Galileo. <laughs> Galileo, we understand, Galileo. When the earth came up that morning, Sorry, when the sun came up that morning back in 1633, we branded you a heretic and threw away the key. Congratulations, you're pardoned. We know you're surprised. Your pardon's retroactive, all signed and notarized. Galileo, Galileo, it's notarized, Galileo. How can we write what surely was wrong? Your description of the universe was right all along. 
Someday man will land on the sun and have a clay then to keep from burning up. He will make the trip at night, Galileo. Galileo. Oh, there at night, Galileo. Galileo, you show courage to surrender, you refuse. You finally pardoned after falsely accused. We thought you were a sinner to make us look the fool. But you went to confession, now everything is cool. We hope no hard feelings, move on, look ahead. At last you're a free man, even though you're dead. Though you are dead, Galileo, amen. how I got my start. Um, my start, well, my parents were dating. <laughs> and it was getting serious, and I was born on August 23rd, which meant that approximately the previous Thanksgiving, my parents had sex, but since it was Buffalo, they might have jumped in bed just to get warm. <laughs> and so we moved to Washington, I went to the Marines, I said, and I came home, and I started playing piano around town. Not fancy places. I mean, dive. We're talking subterranean toilets. I, that, that I'm not proud. I, mean, I started at the bottom, but I managed to work my way down. And I got a job on Capitol Hill, in a little hotel bar on Capitol Hill. This is the quintessential. It's called the Carol Arms Bar. I may have met some of you in that place. In fact, I can tell you the truth about it. If the statute of limitations has run out. <laughs> Uh, everybody's dead. The owner of the hotel is dead. All the members of Congress who frequented the place, they're dead. All the members of the media, they're all dead. Dead. Now, I can now tell you that I was a piano player in a whorehouse. <laughs> but I never got on the elevator. Now, one night, one night I had the granddaddy of all hecklers. I've had my share, but this was the worst. I am not embellishing on this one whip. I was playing a song. And it was a man in the crowd. He worked on Capitol Hill. He worked for the senator from Mississippi, James O. Eastland. He was his administrative assistant. He had had a few drinks, and had I, but he reached across the piano and started choking me. And he said, you son of a bitch, I'll have you run off the hill. You get that southern ownership of Capitol Hill at the time. I don't know why he was so upset. In fact, I wasn't even playing my own song. I was playing a song by the aforementioned Tom Lehrer. Oh, I mean, it's been so long, I don't know if I can remember it. Anyway, it's just... I want to go back to Dixie. Want to be a Dixie Pixie, want to eat corn pone that's coming out of my ears. Want to be a southern gentleman, put my white shade on again, I ain't seen one good lynch in it years. The land of the boy evil, where the laws are medieval, be it ever so decadent, there's no place like home. I don't know why that man from Mississippi was so upset. <laughs> oh, I forgot to mention. While I was singing the song, I had a white pillowcase over my head. With these... <laughs> I was young. I was idealistic. Anyway, I wrote a song about the environment. This was a show up in Alaska that we did for PBS. I love Alaska. And the whole point is, I wanted to be a real authentic Alaskan. I wanted to be an Alaska sourdough. I want to do the dangerous things in Alaska. I want to eat a sled dog in the tundra for survival. I just want to live dangerous. I want to, I want to make candles out of bear wax. I don't know what bear wax is, but I wanted to make candles out of it. I want to live dangerously. Make fish hooks out of wolves' teeth. Live on the wild side. Go into a saloon and say, Hi, I'm from Washington. Let's talk gun control. Well, <laughs> at the time they were building the Alaska Pipeline, amid uh, many warnings from environmentalists, including the Sierra Club, that that pipeline would destroy the herds of caribou. Well, as it turned out, the opposite was the case. The uh, pipeline was a magnet to, to the caribou. The caribou held romantic encounters, if you will, in the very shadow of the pipeline which inspired the caribou love song. <laughs> well, I'm down to get you by the pipeline, honey. Better be ready around half past eight. Now, honey, don't be late. We'll get lewd beneath the crude. <laughs> We'll show those Sierra Club greenies 
What turns on a caribou? It's that one night stand of love where the oil flows above. Tomorrow night at the pipeline rendezvous. It's the pipeline out in the sticks. But to us, it's a Motel 6. <laughs> Tomorrow night at the Pipeline Rendezvous. As the oil goes flowing through, this dipstick's just for you. Tomorrow night at the Pipeline Rendezvous. Tomorrow night at the Pipeline Rendezvous. Tomorrow night at the Pipeline Rendezvous. Boo, boo, rendezvous. Alaska Pipeline Rendezvous. point and show people are wondering how I remember all that stuff. I get that all the time. I say, how do you remember all that stuff? And I would say, remember what? <laughs> well, there are ways uh, to improve one's uh, memory, uh, crossword puzzles, you know, people just run their over-the-counter product. What I do, I, I try and see if I can get through a kind of a, a, a difficult song, kind of a complex song, it's called 44 POTUSes, POTUS, President of the United States. And in this song, we really cover the entire history of our country in about two minutes. So uh, wish me luck. It's, it's a tough one. Here we go. 44 POTUSes. George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Jane Madison, Jane Monroe, John Quincy Adams, Jackson, and Van Buren. William Henry Harrison caught a cold and he was done. Then John Tyler Tippecanoe, James K. Polk, how do you do? Zachary Taylor, call him Zach. Miller Fillmore, what a hack. Franklin Pierce, who is he? Jane Buchanan, obscurity. Who's next? I don't recall. Oh my gosh, I've hit the wall. Then a snag in my song. Come back later, move along. Johnson, Graham, and Rutherford, Hayes, these fellows meant no harm, but alas for James A. Garfield, the poor man bought the farm. Chester Allen didn't go far, Mama, where's my pa? Cleveland or White House, ha, ha, ha. Another Harrison named Ben, who's next? Grover Cleveland, what again? William McKinley, no, 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 don't shuffle off the buffalo. Sam Juan Teddy making history, Big Bill Taft. Fatter than Christie. Woodrow Wilson went to war and war and Harding was a bore and Calvin Coolidge you could trust. Herbert Hoover, Wall Street bust. FDR had the longest stay. Harry Truman bombs away. Ike was a general, as you know. JFK knew Marilyn Monroe. LBJ wrote the voting rights book. Richard Nixon was a crook. Ford's time in office kind of quick, and it didn't help when he pardoned Dick. Jimmy Carter and the Peanut Man. I bet he wishes that he never heard of Iran. Ronnie Reagan from the start always seemed to be acting the part. Bush 41 is for Hillary. I'm guessing 43 and the whole family. Under 42, the economy was sound. Clinton balanced the budget, but he fooled around. 44 ends my drama. Jury still out and Barack Obama. Wait a minute. Who did I leave out? Abraham Lincoln, our greatest POTUS. I left him out on purpose just to see if you would notice. I made it. Thank you very much. presidential poll. Here's the way it works. <laughs> we pretend that election day is tomorrow. I cannot believe there's anybody left in this country who has not made up his or her mind. Some of you have already voted. And I will name the candidates. And when I name the one that you already voted for or intend to vote for, if you would just humor me and applaud when I come to your candidate. 
Now, I will not embarrass anybody, I will not single anybody out, but I must get an accurate reading so I can go back to Washington in the morning and submit my report. <laughs> so that I have been to Greensboro, North Carolina, therefore, I am. <laughs> one only problem, a lot of you know each other in here, and you may not want to vote in front of one another. Well, then I suggest you close your eyes while you're voting, all right? <laughs> If the election will be held tomorrow, how many in here have already voted for or intend to vote for Gary Johnson? Thank you. I don't know where he is now, but I'm sure he felt something. Got some libertarians here today. Libertarians are interesting people. They, they're against gun control and they're for legalized drugs, which is why I would never go hunting with the Libertarians. <laughs> the election be held tomorrow. How many in here have already voted for or intend to vote for Donald Trump? I told you to close your eyes. Thank you. If the election be held tomorrow, how many have already voted for or intend to vote for Hillary Clinton? This election is obviously rigged. <laughs> Maybe you're here with someone with whom you disagree politically. Well, we want to solve that. We want you to, to look into each other's eyes in love and harmony and, and, and sing along. You know this song. This is for people who disagree politically. This is an Elvis song. I know you know the, the chorus. This is the one. You and I have a different view. This is your part. But I can help falling in love with you. You ready? Here we go. You and I have a different view. Everybody! But I can help falling in love with you. Very good. My state is red and yours is blue. Hillary is likable to me. 
It's all there in my new marriage vows. Now suppose you're for Trump over Hillary. It's all right. And you're ruling her out, and that's that. Well, neither one is a saint. Mother Teresa, she ain't. But you're for Hitler. Good luck with that. Next January 20th at high noon, Hillary Rodham Clinton will be sworn in as President of the United States. But the very next morning, January 21st, the Republican majority will begin impeachment proceedings. When the proceedings are over, the next president will be the former Vice President, Tim Kaine. But not for long. Because what's the first thing we learned about Tim Kaine? He is very, very fluent in Spanish. So there you have it. Hillary's impeached. Tim Kaine is deported. <laughs> Stay with me now. And according to the presidential laws of succession, the president will be the Republican Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. And in the following election year, 2020, Paul Ryan will have a... Republican opponent in the primaries. And that Republican opponent will be Donald J. Trump. And after that, what will happen? What will happen after that? Frankly, my dear, <laughs> I don't give a shit. Because after 60 years, I decided to pack it in, call it a career, and my last audience has been you, and I cannot ask for a better audience than you have been. And in the audience includes my grandson and my granddaughter-in-law and my one-year-old great-grandson who's backstage. He was one of the early Trump supporters. <laughs> Unemployed white male who never went to college. <laughs> we have other relatives here. Uh, it's kind of complicated. But they're here. <laughs> Believe it or not, my ex-wife's cousins, uh, they are here. So. That's very, very nice. So, just remember this thought, that Washington, D.C. is the capital city of the greatest country in the world where we have the ability to do what I'm going to ask you to do right now. And that's turn to the person next to you, reach out your hand and say, give me all your money. <laughs> and with profound gratitude to all of you for being such a wonderful audience here, I leave you with the exact words that members of Congress say to each other every Wednesday. Have a nice weekend. <laughs> so, farewell, goodbye, bonsoir, auf Wiedersehen, and as we say here in the good old USA, buenas noches. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.